Welcome to this edition of Able Dead On Air, the one and only program that focuses on the needs, concerns, and achievements of the differently able. I've always been your host, Lawrence Seiler. Arlene is off today. On this fantastic episode, we will focus on the Me Too Orchestra. What are they, who are they, and what they represent um, here in Vermont. Um, welcome. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Caroline Witten. Good to see you. And <clears throat> Mr. Ronald Brownstein and Caroline Witten to Thank you in On Air. Good Welcome. to see you. Thank you very much. What are the missions and goals of the Me Too Orchestra? Well, our mission is to, uh, through supportive ensembles and rehearsals and performances, to erase the stigma surrounding mental health issues. Um, and our goals really are, uh, it's, it's multi-layered. We have certain goals within our orchestras, uh, and that comes about because we have people who are living with mental illnesses and people who don't have a diagnosis. And what we wanna show there is that people can work very well side by side, whether or not there's a mental health diagnosis involved, um, because a lot of people in our community don't recognize that that's possible. Why is, why is it the fact that they don't recognize I think Certain because we don't with, have these conversations. Mm -hmm. We don't have these conversations. People are afraid due to the stigma and, and potentially discrimination uh, surrounding a mental health diagnosis. They don't talk about uh, what they might be living with. And because it's, it's a silent issue, mm -hmm. people rely, they form their opinions around, say, bipolar disorder or schizophrenia around what they hear on the news okay. or see in a movie. And it's a very distorted uh, mm -hmm. viewpoint. Now both of you can answer this. What is uh, some of the history of Me Too? How did you guys get started? Well, we got started um, in, in 2011. And um, I'd had a history over, over my career, um, very uneven, very high points and very low. The, best orchestras in the world and then under the bridge for, for extended periods. And you've worked in Europe and some other places as yeah, well. Yeah, a lot of very fancy places and then very not fancy mm -hmm. situations. Mm -hmm. And um, at a certain point I just got fed up with it, with um, being discriminated against. So I decided to create my own orchestra, created people like myself. Mm -hmm. um, at the beginning it was just for me to kind of feel a space that I was um, safe in, that I wouldn't be judged, that I wouldn't be um, analyzed or discriminated against. And I found that very, very healing. And originally it really was for me to heal myself, but as I um, felt more comfortable sharing my, my, um, myself as a musician and as a person, as someone living with a bipolar disorder, um, I found there are many people like me, and they started to come to the, this orchestra, and um, um, it, it grew from there. It's okay. now grown to almost 50 people in um, in Burlington mm -hmm. alone, and then about 50 in in Boston. So, how do you this this to both of you? How do you really educate people in your work of Me Too? Because I understand that you, um, there's personal stories that people give and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. So we wanna take that. Yeah, I think, I think the education happens when you create an environment that is safe and stigma free so that people, if they want to discuss uh, their diagnosis or maybe what they're feeling on any given day, that mm -hmm. they feel safe enough to do that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can give somebody all the literature in the world, but until they meet somebody who's living with, like Ronald, bipolar disorder, and they see that that person does not look like what I, you know, saw on television last night or, or whatever, that it, it makes it real and immediate. Mm -hmm. And that's where people start to learn and shed all these uh, these negative ideas that they have associated with the diagnosis. And since you said negative, because a lot of people sometimes are scared of people with mental illness. Yes. Um, and, you know, we've had 
numerous shows on suicide prevention and other things with mental mm -hmm. illness. Mm -hmm. What are some of the misconceptions around people with special needs when you first meet them? Well, I think that a lot of people, beca largely because of media, is they are perceived as being violent, violent, mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. not to be trusted and somehow criminal. Um, they'll break up your house, they'll do every, everything, but actually, more often than not, um, people living with, with a mental illness are more often the um, victim of a crime rather than a, a, a um, mm. pr protagonist. So that's what do you mean by a protagonist? Um, exactly. They're a victim, a not victim. so much not so much a perpetrator. Ah, okay. So that's yeah. that's what I know. Mm -hmm. uh, now, in terms of music, mm. right? Because so, this past week we went to the Barry Opera House and we saw. Um, and matter of fact, we're gonna roll some of that footage. Um, what is your favorite piece of music, and how does music really help you get through your mental illness or dealing with me too? How, mm -hmm. how does that help as far as, as far as music is concerned? Well, my favorite piece is um, Beethoven Fifth Symphony, mm -hmm. especially the fourth movement, because that's the biggest transformation um, breakthrough um, of expression um, up till the Fifth Symphony. Um, all music was really created for classical court com composers, mm -hmm. kings and queens, and they had to follow certain rules and everything. Everything was very, very um, codified. Mm -hmm. And um, in Beethoven, the Fifth Symphony, it just bursts that in its self-expression. Um, was the first concept of the composer as a romantic um, person who could express himself through his What's music. your favorite piece of music? I, I find that, that question really tough. I, I don't know that I have one um, favorite piece. It's usually whatever I happen to be listening to. Like in that moment, it's my favorite. Uh, if I were going to be stranded on a desert island and had to have certain recordings, I'd probably go uh, orchestrally. I'd go with Brahms, mm -hmm. maybe Mahler, one of the symphonies. Yeah, yeah, but it's it's tough. There's so much great music out there. Mm. Okay, um, in terms of it, now, the Me Too mm. started exactly when? When when did it actually start? Our first rehearsal was in September 2011 mm -hmm. here in, in Burlington, Vermont. Yeah, because you guys are originally from Mass. You, you guys live in Right now we live, yeah, we huh. live in uh, just outside of Boston uh, mm -hmm. in Massachusetts. Um, but we, we started the Me Too organization here in 2011, and we, we branched out with an additional orchestra in Boston mm -hmm. in the fall of 2014. Okay. Now, you've... Um, You've worked professionally mm -hmm. uh, in Europe, and you've um, you've uh, have you worked with or collaborated with any other people who uh, famous artists like Vangelis? Well, let's see. I've I've conducted um, many of the great orchestras of the world. Mm -hmm. um, I conducted the Berlin Philharmonic um, when I was 23, and I conducted the San Francisco Symphony and um, the Stuttgart radio orchestras and many radio orchestras mm -hmm. in uh, Switzerland and in Norway and in Israel and in Japan. Um, I had the great honor and privilege um, of being an apprentice of Herbert von Karajan, who mm. was the greatest musician of, of the century um, by all means. And um, he mainly taught me how to listen um, and to get the orchestra to listen to each other, which has really become a main theme in, in, um, in the Me Too experience, not only to listen to each other in the music, but to actually hear each other as people. Mm -hmm. So that's... Because um, when you have, when, when someone has a challenge, mm -hmm. uh, it's great to, it's good, really good to be a good listener. Because mm -hmm. once you are a good listener, you know, it, it brings forth 
uh, you know, not only do you get to collaborate with people, but you get to, you know, just li listen to what they have to say. You know, they're not there. It's like counseling, right? You have to be a good listener to right. understand. And music for you is like, is like counseling, if you will, mm. pretty much, because you're you're channeling your energy, you're challenging, you know, you're challenging yourself mm. into persevering despite your challenge. Right. right. I, I think you hit on something really important and, and something that certainly I experience when I happen to be playing in the orchestra. I, um, I live with the challenges of anxiety, this anxiety disorder every day. Mm -hmm. But you know what? I can't think about that if I'm playing Beethoven. There's no room for anxiety when you're playing Beethoven. You're just so focused on what's going on in that moment focused on what he's doing on the podium, focused on the, the sounds around you in the orchestra. So it's, I don't know that it's so much an escape, but it's definitely the opportunity to kind of let the rest of that go and be right there in that moment with um, other people. <clears throat> I know we still have some time left, but what is some advice that you can, professional advice that you can give to people out there who are living with, <coughs> or your own personal advice, who are living with uh, mental illness or mental challenges because um and another question is um have you I mean you can answer it or not but have you always lived with bipolar disorder and I, I've been living with a bipolar disorder since um, 1985 mm -hmm. and um, it's been a rough road mm -hmm. um, but in the last six years it's been one steady um, even spell and um, mm -hmm. I'm working with that. And you have support. Yeah, I have support and I have an excellent psychiatrist and um, psychiatrist, Families psychologist. Families support as well. Yeah. So it all kind of co comes together. Um, I just wanted to get back to what you asked about advice. Yes. And I think the, the first advice is to, um, as, as you said, get, get the right people on your, your team. You need it dedicated partner who's not only dedicated and loves you but is interested in really finding out <coughs> what it's all about. Um, the nuts and bolts, how to take care of you at home. And then you need a good psychiatrist mm -hmm. who you trust and who do exactly what they say. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't, not willy-nilly about when to take the medication. You have to follow that person and if you don't you should just simply get another psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. um, as far as going forward, once you're stable, uh, I think as far as um, finding a um, finding your way into music, I think the first thing would be to get a, a, um, a fulfilling job mm -hmm. that um, that fulfills your your um, your interest and your desires to contribute to society. Mm -hmm. And then third would be music, mm -hmm. because music is really, um, has to be um, held up, mm -hmm. supported by all of those other things. Um, as far as music goes, I think someone would come and play with us because mm -hmm. it's such a low pressure um, and a very enjoyable, a supportive environment. So I would never go any further than that, mm -hmm. just treatment. Because also historically, music has helped lots of people. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you have mm -hmm. Beethoven who was, um, who was deaf. Um, you have many other musical people, uh, such as um, <coughs> Julio Iglesias mm -hmm. uh, right. and um, the opera singer. Um, <laughs> name it. I can't name him off the top of my head. They're all, they're all, they're all, um, they're all individuals. <laughs> yeah, and they, they yeah. persevere despite their challenges. Right. Um, exactly. Oh, so, I see what you mean. Yeah, in terms of persevering, you know, despite their deafness or despite, you know, what they've gone through. Mm. They, yeah. they, they have, um, Huge histories in music. I yeah. mean, mu music brings out the best in people. Mm. 
you know, as they say, making beautiful, sometimes making beautiful music together helps, you know. It's and, a great mode of expression. And, it's a way and, to get and, things know, out. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so in terms of Me Too, where, where is your next, uh, I mean, what are your real future goals with the Me Too organization? Well, the, the immediate one are uh, to create many um, affiliate organizations which, which are not full orchestras because that's very daunting an idea. We started small with just a small group of people and then we grew over time and now we have a, an orchestra. We're creating affiliate or organizations with just maybe a few people, like five or seven, mm -hmm. that start the germ and they, they, um, they have the same um, uh, philosophies and mission as we do. They use our name and they grow from there little by little so that over time there will be many, many Me Too orchestras. But at this point, we're just starting to sp spread small ones mm -hmm. to g give them place to start from. Now, in terms of collaborations, um, I understand this past Sunday, <coughs> you guys worked with Washington County Mental Health to put on this show. Why did you guys decide to do that? Was there a main reason behind um, collaborating with Washington County Mental Health? Well, they actually extended the invitation to us, and we were thrilled. We had never played in Washington County, and, and certainly the, they suggested the opportunity to play at the Barry Opera House, which for us is, was fabulous. Yeah. So once they extended the invitation, we just start going back and forth and working on you know how to build the audience, how to promote the concert, and, and it, it ended up being a great Mm -hmm. collaboration and, and that's the kind of thing we've done with other uh, es especially mental health organizations um, around the state of Vermont. What are some of the ones that you go some of the concerts that you because you you were in Colchester yesterday. Uh, with Woodside Juvenile Rehabilitation Center mm -hmm. um, which is 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 you know a challenging and a, and a wonderful venue for us. We play in their gymnasium when we go there, and it, it's operated by the Department of Children and Families. Mm -hmm. So we're it, that's an opportunity for us to play with uh, mm -hmm. a population of you know twenty or fewer teens who are in uh, the custody of DCF, and you know bar none, they are all receiving some type of treatment for trauma or some type of diagnosis right. that they've, they've received throughout what are mm -hmm. normally very difficult childhoods. For those that, um, just a little interesting question, a little fun question. Those that want to get into music, despite their challenges, um, what are some of the pros and cons of your, because you, you know, I mean, you're a conductor and mm. you've, you work with the Me Too. Um, what are some of the challenges of working in music, just for, not forgetting challenges, but like working in music on a general, um, people that want to become musicians? Yeah. They mm -hmm. should just quit. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. It's too hard. It's just, well, I, it's just, just to become a musician yeah. um, requires so much discipline. Um, you need to be able to be willing to um, really donate your life to music in a way that um, few other fields demand, a minimum of you know years, ten ten thousand hours a year in the practice room, just just perfecting your skill, mm -hmm. and because um, being a conductor is just not waving your hand <laughs> and doing <laughs> stuff. <Hello. laughs> more than that. Yeah, yeah. well, yeah. It's, it's about communicating, yeah. and that's more than just hands and feet. Yeah, and it's um. It's the whole, it, your whole uh, being. Because there's pros and cons to everything, you know. Um, it's true. What, yeah. what has been your most, um, your best performance that you did, that Me Too did? Like, the absolute best. Well, Do you want to take that? I think we would both say the same thing, probably. Do you want to say it at the same time? No. <laughs> um, um, what question that would lead in? Um, Side by side. Well, for me, the the the. Let's see. I would say the side by side concert, um, which which took place last year, and we brought we brought the musicians from Boston up to Burlington, 
to, to literally sit side by side on the stage at the Flynn Center mm -hmm. in Burlington and we performed together. Yeah. And it was this amazing confluence of seeing kind of all the relationships um, in each of those orchestras then collide you know, together and all these new friendships being formed. Each of the orchestras had, had rehearsed the same music separately, but then to bring that together on one stage and mm -hmm. in this huge orchestra was just, mm -hmm. it was thrilling in a way that, you know, is, is very different than, than other performances. Because they were really collaborating with each other. Yeah. yeah. And um, making something just bigger than life. Does it get, um, how can I put this, uh, with your, if you don't mind me asking this, um, with your challenges, does it get frustrating sometimes when you're on stage and how do you challenge, um, block it out, block it out or channel it, um, channel your frustration? I feel no frustration when I'm conducting. Um, I only feel this incredibly strong connection with, with the text with the, um, the music which has been handed down to us for two and three hundred years. Mm -hmm. It's so captivating and it's so, um, that the world just, all of my troubles and all of my challenges, they just f go to the ceiling and just mm -hmm. leave me alone completely. Um, and then I have a golden hour for the hour after the concert, which is just everything you feel so great about what you did. and. Um, yeah, it's nothing gets in my way. If anything, I can channel some of my um, my manic energy and also my depressive energy. What is the difference, if you don't mind me asking that question? In your opinion, what is the difference? You said man between manic and depression. Manic well, and depression, or manic depressive, well, or, or well, when both. I I feel like I can um, draw on my ma mania. Mm -hmm. Let me just rephrase that. Um, Take your time. I feel that, that in some way um, I can use my mania. Um, that's not true either. I don't use it. Help me with this one. <laughs> um, Am I, is this upsetting you? No, not at all. Just, I'm trying to think. Um, I think it's hard to describe, probably. But, yeah. But, but I, I mean, I, I recognize Feeling those sad or feeling depressed, feeling upset about something. No, no, no. Yeah, my feeling upset or happy or sad, nothing to do with it. It's just the text that I've inherited from the last 200 years. But my mania, when, which is well controlled, I can still draw on it and put it into that uh, performance um, in the way that people, I think people without it can't get it in there as, as strongly. Mm -hmm. De on the depressed side, um, I think that a lot of music is um, varied, very, let's just say, sad. And I feel that I can draw on my s past sadness um, to get an insight into the music um, mm -hmm. in a more deep way. Well, uh, the, there were two pieces in my mind that were extremely happy on, on Sunday's performance. Um, the I don't know the name off the top of my head, but the, the one... Syncopated clock. The syncopated clock. And, uh, and the firework the, for the... No, royal, the Handel Royal. The Handel Royal Fireworks piece. Yeah, that was amazing. And Swan, Swan oh, Lake. Swan Lake. Mm -hmm. But, because it had that, towards the end, it had that... Push. Push, yeah. yeah. Um, so, do you tend to do more <clears throat> happy pieces of music or a little bit of both of sad pieces of music? Because sad can turn into happy, or um, I think that most pieces um, have a happy and a sad contained in them. Mm -hmm. um, it's just hap Let me just start that one over. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, it's fine. Because we'll edit this. We 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 program we play pieces um, that are primarily sad. Did I say that? <laughs> no. Well, the royal uh, fireworks is no, not I, I just er erased that. <laughs> I just okay. said exactly the opposite. Um, we perform mainly pieces that are happy, that are uplifting, um, especially at the end of the concert. We want the audience just to feel great um, about um, about the music and about the breakthroughs that that um, 
can happen through music. Mm -hmm. um, but we also program more somber, introspective music that, um, you know, that can, you know, reach people's more um, deeper emotions. How do you tra channel your anxiety through the Me Too um, performances? Oh boy, uh, it really is about getting kind of lost in the music mm -hmm. for me. It's it's really um, because the anxiety is something that's kind of on my shoulder and always there, and it it, it you know gets worse and better at different times. But uh, and what do you do with me too? You, you uh, well, I actually play French horn in the orchestra. Oh yeah. Um, not you know not every concert, not every piece, but um, but my background is in music as well. So I I studied French horn and. And it's been a real treat for me to play with this orchestra because I actually had given up performing for 18 years. I didn't, I didn't touch a horn. And it was because all of my uh, experiences around orchestral playing up until that point had made my anxiety worse. Mm -hmm. I was having panic attacks. I just, I was not happy. And then Ronald came into my life and he had this vision about creating an orchestra where that kind of stress wouldn't be a part of the of, of the mix that you know the whole function would be to be supporting each other and celebrating our uh, our achievements and what we can do on the instruments and uh, with that in mind I went out and and bought an old horn and started playing again and so for me for me it's really been um, it's, so it's turned really, the music on its head for so me. you've really channeled your bad anxiety good anxiety and so on yeah, I mean it's funny that music used to be such so challenging for my anxiety, and now it's actually more of an escape and a and a, a way for me to kind of soothe myself. Actually, mm -hmm. yeah, so do you tend to like uh, happy pieces of music or sad pieces of music? Boy, uh, you know I think as a brass player, mm -hmm. we tend to we tend to really enjoy playing. The things that are big and happy and and brassy, you know, and have big notes at the end, and yeah. and that's that's a lot of fun to play. As an audience member, though, I, I enjoy those those numbers as well. But I also enjoy like a, a big lush string piece that that maybe provides me with a space to be a little more introspective and kind of think through some things that I'm feeling and. Uh, yeah, so it, you know, it's it's all it's all good and has its place. Um, so why did you join me too? Was there? Uh, um, I mean, I, I know Ronald came into your life, but what? What was the main reason that really drew you into the Me Too organization? I think it was because Me Too gave me a chance to rediscover my love of music without mm -hmm. all the anxiety. Um, mm -hmm and depression that I had been experiencing before when I played. It was really taking, taking music and, and just dropping it into a completely new stigma-free setting. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, I, since I hadn't had that for a couple of decades before, I'd, I'd really, I didn't care about music as much. Uh, but this for me, I, I, I was watching Ronald, you know, working with the orchestra over the weeks and thinking, for the first time in two decades that I really wanted to be making music again. Mm -hmm. But what, what made you really quit? Or, uh, you know, all kidding aside, you know, you said quit in the middle, in the beginning of the interview. Yeah, yeah, well, and I, and I think it, get back, it gets back to what Ronald was saying. I mean, it's such a tough way to make a living. And, and that, I'm, I'm the child of, of musicians, and, and I, I always thought that I would, this, that's how I would make a living, that I would be playing the French horn and making a living. And the reality of that is that it's, it's incredibly stressful and incredibly difficult to get a good paying job. Yeah, in certain and, cities I've seen walking in, in New York, because I'm originally a New Yorker. Right. And here in Vermont, you see people with their guitar cases in the street, and people throw money at, you know, because they're trying to make some money at what they do. And often they can make more money playing, you know, gigging out on the street, busking, as they say, out on the street for have a few you, hours than somebody that? can do, you know, teaching lessons or whatever. Uh, have, so, you, have, you, have you done that? I haven't done it because I never got, um, you know, I played for a couple of years after college, but really never was in a position where I had to make my living just playing music. Mm -hmm. And for me, I, I reached that point where the, the panic and anxiety I had around it was so great that I discovered that I really love the administrative side of things and how, you know, 
these challenges like how do you build an organization? How do you raise the money? How do you market it to people? So I started going into so you that didn't side. Start, you didn't start as a struggling musician, right? Well, I guess I, I thought that was going to be my start. That's how it was going to be, but I got out pretty quickly. <laughs> did, you, did you have any struggling moments in your, um, in your career at first? Uh, and not how at, did you deal with them? Not at first. I think that um, I went to Juilliard. Yes. And then after I graduated, um, I won first prize gold medal in the um, most important conducting competition in the world. Uh, so which is what? The Herbert von Karajan um, International Conducting Competition. Yes. And it's held in Berlin with the Berlin Philharmonic. Mm -hmm. And um, so me, it went off like a, you know, like a rocket. And it was that way, you know, for many years um, until I started to have, you know, people would say, something's wrong here. It's going too high. He's just off the charts. And they started to lose confidence in me because they couldn't handle me. And then there would also be periods where I would, you know, just be so tired I could barely get out of bed when I'm depressed and I, I couldn't go or I would become kept paranoid and um, think that there were conspiracy theories against me and all of these kind of things. So The paranoia of it, yeah. right, of, of, of being one. Did you ever have any... When, um, I would, when I would be in a rough period, I started to yeah. feel paranoid. Um, and I often was, it was often well-based. Mm -hmm. Have you ever had any paranoia on stage? No. No. I don't feel anything on stage. I'm only feeling the interaction with the musicians yeah. and hoping that the audience can, can um, feel the same thing. Um, be, uh, before we end uh, and we show the footage of the Barry Opera House, um, can you um, tell us where people can reach you at Me Too if they want to get in touch? Absolutely. With you? Yeah, we, um, our website is www.metooorchestra, and that's M E and the numeral two orchestra.org. Mm -hmm. uh, so, very easy to find us online. The phone number there is actually my cell phone number, 802 238 8369, and, uh, and all the email contact information is, is there as well. So, we'd love to hear from people. Okay, let's take a look at some footage from the Berry Opera House and the Me Too organization. Let's take a look at this. <laughs>
Before we end, um, we'd like to say thank you again to thank the you Me for Too, having us. For the Me thank Too organization. And um, well, that puts an end to this edition of Abled and On Air. I'm Lauren Seiler. See you next time. Play some music. <laughs>